thousands of British soldiers who fought on the Somme passed through Albert, which was situated just a few miles from the front lines. It had a vital importance as an administration centre. It was also used for billeting and a supply town. It also provided medical facilities, so it became important to the British. After the war, Albert was adopted by Birmingham because the city battalions had grown to like the town and its industries rendered it a town to which Birmingham could readily assist, such as machine tools, agricultural implements and other metal and hardware goods. Birmingham decided to fund the building of a hospital and almshouses at a cost of around £5,000, which were paid for by donations from the public and businesses. Uh, this is what the hospital looks like today, almost 90 years since the Lord Mayor came to lay the foundation stone. And you can still see the name Birmingham proudly written in green tiles. Albert's main street was renamed Rue de Birmingham. In the years following World War II, the ties between the two weakened, but in recent years, the links between Albert and Birmingham have been re-established, and the current Lord Mayor is visiting Albert this month. So with me now is the Lord Mayor of Birmingham, which just happens to be one of the Ladywood local councillors, as, as it happens, but you would have been here anyway, anyway, because I would. you're really interested in the First World War, and you've got a history background as well, and you're going across now to represent Birmingham in Albert. I mean, Birmingham's got good links with Albert, hasn't it? So what yep. kind of things are you expecting to do when you get there? Well, I, I hope to seal the good relationship between Birmingham and Albert, um, to remember and commemorate those Birmingham lads who lost their lives in the Battle of the Somme, and to talk to representatives from Albert about what Birmingham means to them and the contribution this city made to rebuilding Albert after the First World War because I understand that the relationship didn't just end with the war, that people from Birmingham went across to help rebuild quite a devastated uh, town. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to doing all that. And uh, we'll be taking um, local historians with us who will be able to give us guided tours and, and tell us about the particular aspects of the battles and, and, and what went on during the First World War in Albert and surrounding areas. So it, it, it's what, what a passion. Who, who wouldn't want to travel to France? Who wouldn't want to pay tribute to Birmingham's fallen heroes? And who wouldn't want to, to go on a guided tour um, um, of all the, um, the important historical places of the Battle of the Somme. So it's, it's, it's like a dream, dream trip for me, although it will be a very, very sombre occasion, obviously. Indeed, yeah. So look, look out for that. We'll try and have uh, a report on that later on Somme 100. Going to Albert today, there are an awful lot of buildings there that <coughs> are the product of Birmingham's commitment to that city. Uh, huge numbers of uh, buildings built in the Art Deco style. Uh, it's a really fascinating place and um, uh, I think Birmingham should feel uh, immensely uh, proud that it contributed to the reconstruction of that city. Strangely, of course, m much of Albert and the surrounding villages were reconstructed uh, uh, from monies that were paid by Germany, the reparations post-war, which paid for it. But Birmingham's commitment to Albert is undoubted and um, uh, every time I go to Albert and look around the place and see the way in which Art Deco uh, you know, predominates in some of the sort of civic buildings there and um, uh, the cinema and all sorts of places like that, it, it, it's a really magnificent testimony to what, what Birmingham did after the war. Now the chances are that anybody, even with a minimal knowledge of the First World War, will have seen this picture before, or something like it. It's of Tiepvel, a major memorial to the missing, on the Somme, which contains the names of 73,000 people, all of whom have no known grave.
Thiepfel was a small agricultural village before the war, but it's now internationally respected because it was chosen to be the site of the memorial. Thiepfel as a village uh, was really never thought of as being an important location uh, to people in this country uh, before the war. Uh, but um, it had a small uh, reputation as being a producer of uh, you know, agricultural produce and uh, it was important to the Somme economy. It was a village of about 400 people. Uh, had a substantial chateau there, a nice, nicely elevated position. But uh, in 1914 the German army came there and it, it became the location which was uh, a focus of attention on both the German army's part and the French army's part because it was identified as a tactically significant position. The British army came to the Somme in 1915 uh, and realised that the capture of Thiepval was going to be uh, you know, in instrumental in giving them artillery observation and control over more distant positions. It was you know, like it, it was it was the one of the positions that would unlock subsequent moves forward. So uh, during the course of um, 1916, whilst Haig was planning uh, the Great Push, uh, the Battle of the Somme as we know it today, uh, Thiepval was identified as, as one of the key positions. Um, <clears throat> they, the capture of Thiepval was entrusted to uh, two uh, locally raised divisions, the 36th Division from Northern Ireland, uh, and the 32nd Division, which was principally comprised of men from Manchester and Salford uh, and some other PALS units from uh, Scotland and uh, Newcastle upon Tyne. But it was a locally raised division uh, and the capture of Val was something which was regarded as uh, almost of strategic significance. Uh, once Thiepval had fallen, you'd have artillery control and observation over other positions that the German army uh, possessed on the Somme. And um, uh, the fight for Thiepval was um, something which, uh, on the opening day of the Battle of the Somme, went tragically and catastrophically awry. Uh, the 36th Division uh, captured the positions north of Thiepval, uh, around the Schwaben Redoubt, but uh, Thiepval village itself uh, was not captured. It's always a matter of great conjecture between the historians who wrote the history of the 36th Division that um, uh, they explained their failure subsequently on the failure of the 32nd Division. 36th Division couldn't be resupplied with small arms, ammunition and uh, water. Eventually they were pushed back. So uh, Thiepval essentially stayed um, untouched during the course of the 1st of July. Uh, and it was only subsequently during the course of September and October that these positions finally fell to the 18th Division. Michael Stedman is rightly proud of the part that he and fellow historians played in establishing a visitor's centre at Thiepfell. When we established the visitor centre, we had no idea of what sort of uh, impact it would may make. Um, we thought there would perhaps be a few thousand visitors annually, uh, and there are literally hundreds of thousands of visitors annually. Um, we are immensely proud of the visitor centre. Um, uh, there were three historians involved in it. Uh, Nigel Cave, uh, Professor Peter Simpkins and myself. And um, uh, there was a great desire at the time to make the Thiepval visitor centre into something which would give proper and due regard to the doings of British troops at Thiepval. It's quite a hard fought battle in actual fact because many people in France of course wanted it to be uh, the centre of focus for the French army's doings in that area which were substantial but uh, I think what, what has happened is that Thiepval has become uh, uh, if you like a um, an opportunity for the sort of enormous sacrifice that was made by uh, British troops during the Battle of the Somme to be properly regarded. Thiepval became the, the site of the memorial to the missing, but
but there were no facilities there, no educational facilities. Uh, at simplest level, you simply couldn't go there and go to the toilet. Um, you passed through, but the existence of a visitor centre now has made that um, a, a proper place to undertake a, a, an educative and informed visit to the Somme, and we are immensely proud of it. My name is Dawn Drouin. Yep, so you're from uh, Cradley Heath? Cradley Heath, yes. My family name used to be Appleby. So I came to France 30 years ago when I married a, uh, married a French boy who I met on a holiday in England. And I've been working at Teat Valley the Visitor Centre since it opened uh, nearly 11 years ago. Just ask about uh, scratching. Do you obviously like scratching? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I don't get them very often though, unless the odd uh, black country friend comes out and <laughs> brings a few. Now we've come out of the main exhibition hall to the entrance to the Oratory Church because I want to show you these plaques behind us. One of them in particular is of great significance. It's to a man called Francis Fitzgerald Waldron, and he had a key role to play in the Royal Flying Corps. It wasn't until I started to research him that I realised his significance in First World War history, because he was in the very first squadron in the Royal Flying Corps, which took off for France in 1914. And in fact, he was the very first pilot to take off on that day. A hundred years to the date of that event, TNT themselves went across the place where they landed as a place called Glissy near Amiens. The Western Front Association held a commemoration on the very spot where he and his squadron landed. And youngsters from TNT News, themselves former pupils of the Oratory School, went to find out what had happened to him. At the Oratory Church in Ladywood, there is a large plaque to commemorate a First World War hero, Major Francis Fitzgerald Waldron. He was a pupil at the Oratory School, a boarding school next to the church. Now it's our task to find out what happened to him. Now for a little bit of research. The Mouth War Grave Cemetery website says that he was buried in Eucos St. Main. Where is it? Where are we? Don't It'll take us ages to get to there. And don't forget the plaque that says Epinoy. What's it look like? There it is. That's what it looks like. There's our man. Freddy Waldron. This picture actually shows us is quite interesting because he crash landed behind German lines and the Germans partly reconstructed his plane. This is a famous picture which was taken in 1914 at Montrose, which is where the squadron was based before the war. And this man in the top corner is Harvey Kelly. He's the man that landed first. And Waldron is this man down here looking. Sitting next to the really big man, who was a man called Burke, who was in charge of the squadron. A hundred years ago to this very day, planes like this landed here. One of these pilots is Francis Fitzgerald Waldron. Some records say he was first to take off from England. For his fire tiger moth from the rear seat. Uh, that's because when they were used as trainers, uh, when the instructor got out, it didn't change the centre of gravity and the pupil was then used to flying in the back. He made an overpass, turned around and came back and landed into wind. Lovely piece of grass here and the, and the wind is very calm after yesterday when it was quite a, a rough old day. It's amazing how fragile this is. It's just wood and fabric and it could easily get torn to pieces. The normal cruising speed is 80 miles per hour, 72 knots. The maximum speed is 139. 
Right, so if you pull the stick back to get the nose up. Isn't it amazing that a hundred years ago, a man from Ladywood ended up on this very spot? On the day he was killed, Francis Fitzgerald Waldron flew over this village in this direction. As he flew over, his plane crash landed in the fields over there. He was picked up by the Germans and taken to a village called Epponai, which you can see in the distance. Sadly, Warden died of his injuries and the Germans buried him next to this church. This is the church that's on the plaque. We now know that he was dug up and taken to a Commonwealth Wargrave Cemetery, which is a few miles away. Let's go. It's here, this is it. Now we've finally arrived at the cemetery. Now all we've got to do is find out where his grave is. W. 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 Eight A twenty six. It's been a long day, but at last we find his grave. Thank you, Francis for all your effort for saving our country. Isn't it amazing that someone from our school could achieve something like this? Major Francis Fitzgerald Waldron, 19th Hussars, Royal Flying Corps, 3rd July 1916, age 29. And we'll be hearing more from those enthusiastic youngsters later in the programme. Now, a keen local historian of the First World War is John Hale, and he too is interested in the Royal Flying Corps and its history. Airmen of the Black Country was the title of a talk given to members of the Wolverhampton branch of the Western Front Association. The speaker, John Hale, has researched memorials across the area and has discovered that numerous men joined the Royal Flying Corps as the RAF was first known. The West Midlands was uh, an important area for engineering and so when the Royal Flying, Flying Corps began it was a fertile recruiting ground because they needed men with mechanical experience who'd worked in the um, motor engine industries and so they were suitable people to help service the flying machines of the Royal Flying Corps and then many of them went on to actually be pilots themselves. There's a young man called George Carradine from Cradley. He volunteered for the Worcesters in 1914 and as he had been a mechanical engineer at uh, Josiah Hingley's in Netherton, it was decided that he could use his skills better as a mechanic in the Royal Flying Corps. So he volunteered for the Royal Flying Corps, became a mechanic and served for three years in France looking after the aircraft, then decided to volunteer for flying training. Unfortunately, he died in flying training when his Sopwith Camel crashed when he was making an approach into land into his station and perished and body brought back to St Luke's in uh, Cradley and buried there. Now what seemed astonishing to me is that you, you, in your talk you had about 20 people and only seven of them were actually killed or shot down by the Germans and the, the rest were, were, were killed probably in this country and training and things like that? That's correct, yes. the. Um I, I, had, I had read in the past how many people died in flying training before they even made it to the front and although it's a very small statistical sample just looking at the airmen who are on half a dozen or so local war memorials the uh, that was borne out in truth in that we had four airmen died of sickness two airmen died in crashes of aircraft in which they were passengers, three pupil pilots died whilst learning to fly, and four pilots who were experienced pilots, either flying instructors or operational pilots, and they died in crashes. So only seven of the men in my talk were actually killed by the Germans, just as many men perished in crashes here in the UK. 
suppose it's not surprising really thinking about the perilous state of the planes. Yes, engine uh, reliability was not as good as it is today. The aircraft were also very light and subject to the vagaries of the weather. I said there's one poor lad who unfortunately fell into a, who, who flew into a tree and was killed that way when he was in flying training. He was flying in a Morris Farman Shorthorn trainer aircraft in Thetford in Norfolk and must have been caught by a gust of wind, flew into a tree, crashed and died. The There was a court of inquiry held after every death and the report of the court of inquiry is very simple. It simply states, flying low, flew into tree, no fault of the machine. One of the young men involved in the talk was doing his flying training at Castle Bromwich and when his death was reported in the Dudley Herald he gave the little piece of information that he flew his aircraft to Himley Hall and landed in Himley Park whilst the Worcestershire Cadet Battalion were on camp there and of course he had been a member of the Worcestershire Cadets so he was able to show off his aircraft to his old chums in the Worcesters. It was, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, uh, I think there can't have been as many trees in Himley Hall <laughs> as there are today. Now, if you're interested in the local men of the Royal Flying Corps, you really need to get yourself down to RAF Cosford, where they've got a real First World War plane, two replica planes, and also memorabilia of a former Wolverhampton pilot, Kevin Furness. You won't be disappointed. And we'll be hearing more about Kevin Furness and the letters he wrote home later in the series and also more from John and his talk in the new series of Doorstep History on Big Centre TV later this year. And after the break we'll be finding out more about what it was like at home in 1916.